Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, Returns on Renewable Energy Investments. My name is Rich Myers, and I'm the editor for the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is more commonly known as NCAT. Um, NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization with six regional headquarters across the country. We work on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. And one of the services we offer is a range of technical assistance on energy projects, including site assessments, feasibility studies, and other energy studies. Um, today's webinar will give participants a chance to have their questions answered by our experts, but we're always glad to help. You can get in touch with us anytime, and we'll have contact information later on in the webinar. Today's webinar is being webcasted by NCAT and is funded by the Southern Risk Management Education Center, uh, which is part of the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture and funded by the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And we're grateful to the SRMEC for its funding and uh, support of this webinar. Today's presentation will be about an hour long and we'll follow it up with time for questions uh, from all you folks who are listening. As you're listening, you can type in any questions you might have in the questions box there on your screen. And I'll gather them up, sort them out, and have our presenter, Dave Ryan, answer as many as we have time for um, following his presentation. And please don't be shy about asking questions during today's uh, webinar. We won't be able to get to all of them during the webinar, but um, our experts will get back to you uh, via email in the next few days. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCAT's ATRA web page which is www.incat.atra.org. ATRA, um, which is also known as the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service, um, and we're grateful for their support as well. And also, before we begin, I just want to remind our viewers to take a few minutes to complete the survey for today's seminar. Um, when the seminar is over and you sign out, you'll get the survey right away. And I especially want to call your attention to one of the questions in the survey that allows you to pose more detailed um, questions about technologies or maybe about a project you have in mind to NCAT's energy specialists. Uh, all those specialists will answer your questions within two weeks of receiving them. And remember, as I said, we always, we always welcome your energy-related questions you're welcome to call our toll-free technical assistance line at 1-800-346-9140. And if you prefer to ask a question via email, we also invite you to go to our ATRA project website, which is www.atra.incat.org, and click on the Ask an Ag Expert button. Uh, it'll walk you through the process. And don't worry if you didn't get that phone number uh, or website; they'll be on your end of, or, or on, excuse me on your screen at the end of the webinar. Um, we respond to all the questions we receive, and I might want to emphasize that this is a service that we offer free of charge. Okay, so our presenter today is Dave Ryan. Dave joined Incat in 2004. He's a registered professional engineer and has many years of experience in energy conservation and renewable energy. Before he came to work at NCAT, Dave worked for a major electric and natural gas utility company. And in that role, he developed renewable energy programs and interconnection standards, working with many different customers to help them tie their renewable energy generators to the utility grid. And along with numerous other sustainable technologies he's incorporated into his own life, Dave has incorporated renewable energy systems in his home, including solar electricity, solar water heater, passive solar heater, and active solar space heating. Uh, Dave also made his own biodiesel fuel from waste cooking oil and used it exclusively in his car for nearly two years. He's a founding member of the Montana Renewable Energy Association and has been an officer and board member on that organization for more than 10 years. Okay, so I think it's time to get started, so I'm going to turn things over to Dave. Thanks, Rich. and. Um I'm trying to get this thing to go to the next page. There we are. Um, again, we want to thank the Southern Risk Management Education Center and um, 
Uh, I wanted to also emphasize that ATRA, uh, www.atra.ncat.org, is a project that's run by NCAT. Uh, so I um, want to make sure that everyone uh, understood that relationship. Uh, now, what we'd like to talk about today, uh, you know, we all get a lot of information. If, if we're interested in renewable energy, we're almost bombarded with information about the systems, about the costs, about the benefits, and a lot of times uh, the systems happen to be uh, somewhat oversold, and a lot of the times the downside of uh, the renewable energy systems are neglected. And so what happens is people actually uh, install systems and then they can be disappointed in uh, the uh, output of the systems uh, or uh, how how the systems are working. So uh, I wanted to make sure everybody understood that uh, we are not cheerleading uh, for renewable energy. I wanted to make it very clear that um, I am a strong proponent of renewable energy. Uh, it has a lot of uh, potential and uh, it is a, a big part of our future. Um, and we just uh, wanted to make sure that everyone had a good idea of uh, what they might run into um, that they might not hear from uh, people trying to sell the equipment. So we want to be very realistic about the costs and the risks. We want to show you how you can find incentives to put the systems in. Uh, we want to talk about finding where to find equipment and technical assistance about the uh, renewable technologies. Uh, some of these things can get to be complicated. How to work with dealers, installers uh, is very important uh, when you're going to install a new system. And uh, then we've got some very quick uh, overview of uh, some renewable energy projects, ballpark costs and risks and things that might go wrong. So why are we all here? And uh, this, is, uh, this pretty much says it, that small family farmers are directly threatened by large scale mechanization developed in an era of cheap energy. The energy crisis is an economic opportunity for America's small farm family farmers. So um, if, if you wanna think about that a little bit, that um, as long as uh, small farmers are in a position to uh, generate their own energy or create uh, fuels for themselves uh, from renewable resources, then uh, they can move away from uh, their dependency on fossil fuels. And we think that that's uh, the, the way to go in the future. We want to be realistic about the costs and risks. And, and it's very true that renewable energy reduces many kinds of risks. Now, uh, about a year ago, uh, we had the tsunami earthquake uh, in uh, hit Japan, and the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power plant uh, was heavily damaged, and uh, this has uh, caused uh, radiation uh, to um, enter the atmosphere, and so this is uh, not going away, and in fact, it has uh, come over uh, all the way over to the United States. A little closer to home, uh, the Horizon Platform oil spill in the, the Gulf of Mexico uh, really disrupted fishing and uh, tourism industry in the Gulf. Uh, very uh, big deal down there. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, if a lot of those renewable technologies, for example, if we have a wood spill, probably not a big deal. So uh, the renewable energy does reduce some risks. However, it's not risk-free. Uh, we can uh, have windstorms that blow solar electric systems off of our roofs. Uh, we have had uh, more wind turbine installations, and therefore we have more wind turbine failures. Uh, so you can see some uh, very catastrophic failures of wind turbines there. Also, uh, performing maintenance on wind turbines uh, requires fall protection, and uh, it's uh, takes special training. Um, there, there is also hazardous uh, hazards of vandalism that we've seen uh, out west. The uh, sometimes remote solar systems are uh, prone to uh, being shot. So that's uh, that one. 
and the really the good news is is renewable sources of energy are everywhere. Um, we get about ten thousand times as much solar energy as what we use uh, striking the surface of the earth. So there's probably no way we're ever going to be able to use it all. Um, it shows up in a lot of different forms, and uh, it's all a manifestation of the sunlight that's hitting the, the earth. So here's the downside is small-scale renewable energy is usually not cheap. So uh, here you can see a comparison of a four kilowatt solar electric array. And I, it might seem like I'm picking on solar electricity. I, I do that uh, for a couple reasons. One is it's very widespread. There's uh, a lot of solar electricity being installed everywhere around the world. Um, it's very common. It all also happens to be the most expensive uh, solar or the most expensive source of renewable electricity. So uh, it, it's sort of the, the worst case economics for um, renewable energy. So that's why it might seem like I'm picking on it. Anyway, the, the system basically costs the same uh, everywhere. And, uh, but depending on how much sunlight you get in your location, uh, you can see Yakima, Washington uh, gets about half the uh, solar, or about two-thirds the solar that Phoenix gets. So the same system in Phoenix will generate uh, a lot more energy than the, the system installed in Yakima, Washington. So the, the real bad news is, you know, without incentives, the simple payback is very long even in a place where uh, we get good sun, uh, Fresno, California, we still have a simple payback without incentives uh, of about 23 years. And again, uh, the, the price of solar components, particularly the solar panels, has been dropping uh, pretty fast. And these are a couple years old, so it might be a little better nowadays, but um, you still have to be aware that the, uh, the systems are expensive and they're going to take a long time to pay back. Why is it so hard to beat utility and gas station prices? Well, uh, the electric utilities and our fossil fuel in infrastructure has been around for a long time. It's a very efficient um, production and manufacturing system. Uh, it's huge. We have huge coal uh, mines. We have huge coal-fired power plants. Uh, we've got a large infrastructure in uh, distribution for these fossil fuels. Also, fossil fuels are heavily subsidized, and we pay in our, that shows up in our taxes, at least $10 billion a year for fossil fuel subsidies in the United States. Other countries, it's, it's even more. Also, what's called the time value of money works against you. And, and very briefly, the time value of money uh, is related to the fact that if you basically put money in the bank or if you make an investment, uh, that investment gets you some kind of a rate of return or, or a rate of interest. And uh, when you buy, buy a renewable energy system, uh, you Basically, you're not getting that interest that you would if you had this other investment. Uh, the, the upshot is, is when you buy a renewable energy generator, you pay for all the energy that that generator is going to make over its lifetime. You pay for that all up front. And the utility lets you pay as you go. So um, it makes it a lot easier to, uh, lot, a lot easier to swallow those monthly bills and, and pay for the utilities over time than it is to pay for the renewable energy at the beginning. There are four factors that could work in your favor. Um, and one is, is generally uh, the cost of energy since uh, about the 1940s, the cost of energy has always been rising. Um, and that is not necessarily the case. Uh, right now, natural gas futures are, futures are at a 10-year low. And so um, those, those things uh, might not actually happen, but the trend is always up. Okay, there are good incentives available, and uh, we're going to talk about those a lot later. 
Uh, there is financing generally available, and we can talk about how to find, at, uh, find out where the financing might be uh, later on in the presentation. And also, there could be a positive impact on property value. Um, there have been studies done, uh, particularly on uh, residential properties uh, that indicate that uh, solar electricity installed on residential properties makes the value of the property higher. There are five good reasons to consider the project. Uh, it is a hedge against energy price increases and maybe a lack of supply. Uh, when you install a solar electric system or a renewable energy generator, uh, you are pretty sure that that generator is going to uh, make energy and you've already paid for the, the energy when you installed it. And so your prices uh, for that energy are not going to go up. Uh, it's very, it makes it very predictable. You know what you're going to get. New management uh, possibilities is where you might be able to install uh, an electric generator somewhere on your farm uh, where you can um, perhaps move livestock, for example, a solar water pumping system. Uh, you can put a well out someplace where there's no electric power and you can power it with a solar generator out there and uh, very cost effectively. It'll beat the utility price, it'll beat the price of hauling fuel out to a generator and that gives you the opportunity to move your livestock into an area where uh, before they had no water so they couldn't use the area. There's obvious environmental benefits. This is the reason uh, most people actually put in so, uh, renewable energy systems. Um, the, the fuel from fossil fuels uh, has a big uh, environmental burden uh, that the renewable energy systems do not. Image and marketing, we've found that uh, in particular these days, uh, people are uh, in, more interested in organic food, local food. They're also interested in uh, farms that produce their food using renewable energy. Uh, so it, it really helps out a, a farm in a lot of ways uh, to have a renewable generator. Uh, you get a lot of personal satisfaction. Uh, it's fun to watch your meter turn backwards. Um, it feels good to know that you're uh, generating your own electricity um, using a renewable resource. And really, you know, it's generally speaking, it's a combination of these things that will help people, uh, that pushes people over the edge to put in a, a renewable energy system. So, how do you find incentives? Uh, there's four places to look. Probably uh, the best or the most common place, uh, most updated, is called. Desire USA database of state incentives for renewable energy and efficiency. Um, then you can always contact dealers and installers. Uh, these folks always know what the incentives are. The most recent, uh, they it's their bread and butter, so they pay attention to that a lot. <coughs> Many times, your utility, <coughs> excuse me, the utility might have incentives in itself. Uh, or at least the utility will know about what incentives are available. So you can contact your utility and talk to them about it. It's always a good idea when you're uh, thinking about installing an electric generation system and tying it to the utility that you get the utility in involved very early in the process, probably the most thing uh, the most important thing or the first thing that you would do. Finally, the state energy office, if you have a state energy office in your state, uh, you can contact them and they know where the incentives are. <clears throat> so Desire USA um, is a project of the Department of Energy. Uh, it's operated by the Northern North Carolina Solar Center and really these guys d uh, do a really super good job of keeping up on all the incentives for renewable energy and energy efficiency. It's a clickable map. Uh, you open it up, it's uh, the United States. You can click on your state. Um, I picked on Arkansas uh, for the presentation and you don't have to read the stuff. Uh, if you want to get on to uh, Desire USA, you can do that and look up uh, for your specific state. There's some sweet deals out there. Uh, finding incentives, probably the best deal out there is the Business Energy Investment Tax Credit. And these are uh, work for 
homeowners as well as commercial businesses and there's a tax credit of 30 percent of the cost of the system that you put in solar small wind and fuel cells and uh, it's it's not a deduction it's a credit there's no limit so you the bigger the system you put in uh, you get 30 percent uh, tax credit for that system some technologies geothermal technologies micro turbines and CHP is called combined heat and power it's also known as cogeneration these kinds of systems are uh, eligible for a 10 percent credit it's been around for a while uh, but it's been expanded <laughs> and uh, it's going to be here till 2016 so it's a it's a really super deal uh, that uh, you can uh, get and you can get a nice tax credit off of your uh, federal income tax. There are also USDA programs, uh, probably the most applicable one to what we're talking about is the Rural Energy for America program. Uh, these are grants and loans for renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. You can get a grant up to 25% of the project cost. You can get a loan guarantee up to 25% of the project cost. So these things uh, are big help uh, for farms and rural small businesses. Now, there's uh, the definition of rural small business is really pretty broad. So uh, if you're at all in a, a rural state um, or you live in a, a smaller town, uh, less than 50,000 people, uh, you can probably qualify as a, a rural small business even if you might not think you you do so it's it's worth looking into uh, contact your local uh, USDA rural development office or if you have a state energy office uh, talk to those folks uh, to find out about these things there's also a lot of information at that URL there at the bottom uh, www.farmenergy.org there's a lot of other USDA programs and these things change over time uh, these are uh, definitely a work in progress uh, equip <coughs> uh, has funding for for projects CSP uh, conservation innovation grant program there's a, a lot of these programs that uh, you can access uh, by calling your local USDA folks so how do you find where to get equipment and other technical resources? Well, our favorite one, of course, is ATRA. Uh, we spend a lot of effort and time um, making sure that this information is valid and updated. Um, it's also called the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, and uh, you can reach it through uh, www.atra.ncat.org. And then, and it's got a lot of features. Uh, there's the ask, ask an expert uh, link that you can click on. There's also uh, on the menu on the left. There's energy alternatives, and um, you can ask the expert, or you can order uh, publications. We have a number of energy-related publications for farmers, um, and these are uh, generally updated every couple of years. So the the information is uh, pretty recent and it's valuable and it's all pertinent to energy efficiency and renewable energy for small farmers so it's a very uh, useful thing uh, if you're interested if you're a small farmer and you want to get in, into uh, renewable energy uh, you can get these at either no cost or very low cost also on the uh, ATRA site is uh, a link for farm energy alternatives and so if you want to look for uh, equipment or funding or local business with uh, expertise you can click this directory of energy alternatives and the directory of energy alternatives when you click on that link it will bring up a, a, a nice little clickable map that you can uh, click on your state again I picked on Arkansas and uh, so you can click your state and then it will bring up another clickable map of your uh, area that will indicate where different businesses or information resources are uh, so you can see there might be a, a little Sun icon there uh, that will be a solar electric dealer or solar thermal dealer uh, the little uh, two arrows is multiple information resources either uh, 
a dealer that does more than one technology or an information resource uh, for general, more general renewable energy uh, information. You click on those little icons and it will bring up uh, a little description of uh, the information resource, uh, whether it's a business or a, a technical resource, uh, contact information and web page information and um, this we keep this uh, updates, updated so it's a, a good resource. Also probably uh, ultimate resource for people looking into renewable energy to find out, you know, gee, what can I do uh, in general is Home Power Magazine. You can uh, obviously subscribe to this uh, or you can, a lot of times, you can get these articles uh, online uh, for free. So you can just uh, uh, Google a um, certain energy resource and it will pop up uh, Home Power Magazine. Uh, these articles are really good. You can do it yourself. Uh, there are a number of uh, web pages or websites out there to help do-it-yourselfers install their own systems or understand systems. Uh, this is uh, my favorite. It's uh, it's builditsolar.com, and um, it has literally hundreds of projects that you can do. You can make your own heat exchangers. You can actually build your own solar electric panels. You can. Uh, there's almost. Uh, uh, unlimited number of web resources that uh, these different uh, projects can direct you to. It's a really super good site. <clears throat> when you're working with dealers and installers, you know, this is, it's pretty much like working with any uh, technical installer, or plumber, or electrician kind of, uh, kind of folks. Same sorts of questions. What kind of experience do you have? Um, we've got a lot of um, new solar solar electricity and wind power is a booming uh, industry and it's very young and so there's a lot of new entries so you've got to be a little bit careful about who you hire uh, to work on projects you want to uh, get references um, the one of the big ones is that we do have a certification uh, with the North American Board of Certified Energy Practi Practitioners also called NAPSEP and so you uh, always want to hire a installer who is NABCEP certified. You want to be sure that uh, you get a nice site assessment as part of the bid. Uh, if they don't come and look at your location, they pr uh, probably won't be able to tell you a very good estimate about what your system is going to produce. Um, you can do a, a certain amount of site assessments from the uh, from the desk and uh, using photographs, uh, but um, it, it really, especially in a solar electric installation, you probably want to get them to come and actually look at your site. The dealers and installers know what incentives there are. Um, they will uh, e they will help you with the paperwork, or they'll even do the paperwork for you. So uh, you want to find out about that. Things like maintenance and services, service contracts, uh, very important with wind turbines. Uh, make sure that you understand um, how what those maintenance costs are going to uh, be. Um, does the bid reflect total costs? This, in particular, wind turbines. Um, I've seen bids come through that um, the people said, gee, this seems too good to be true. Well, it was really too good to be true because, yes, it had the wind turbine, it had the interconnection, it had the wire, but it didn't have a tower. So you definitely have to have a tower. So um, you want to make sure that the bid has the total costs. Interconnection, uh, many, many utilities don't have any costs to interconnect. Um, other utilities have substantial costs, so you need to, the, when you're considering installing an electric generator, uh, renewable or otherwise, the first people you want to talk to is your utility. Make sure you understand their interconnection procedure and your any costs for the interconnection and any potential uh, monthly costs going down the road uh, for your system. Get more than one bid. You can get on the um, Energy Alternatives uh, website and find out who the dealers are in your area. 
<coughs> always talk to more than one and get uh, get a couple quotations, um, and so that you can compare apples to apples. If you have a couple of quotes that are substantially different and you need help, give us a call and we'll help you navigate through those. So <coughs> there are some uh, many, many success stories and so uh, I just kind of wanted to show you a couple of, of examples uh, for these different systems. This, this is sort of a, a typical uh, grid-tied solar electric system, 4.7 kilowatts um, cost Five dollars and fifty-six cents a watt installed, but there was a there's the thirty percent federal tax credit. Also, in Arkansas, had <coughs> very substantial state rebate for the system. So the final system cost you can see is less than half of what the uh, system cost without incentives would be. Here's a larger system, nineteen kilowatts. Uh, there is some economy of scale, so a larger system costs less per watt installed. This one about eighty thousand uh, dollars. Now there was no state tax, or there was no state incentive in this case. So um, these folks just got the thirty percent federal ta tax credit. Um, so there, you can see that their final system cost was uh, relatively uh, higher than the previous system. You can do battery-based systems. Uh, the uh, most typical uh, solar electric system these days does not have batteries. It's just interconnected to the utility grid, and when the utility is, if the utility has an outage, uh, your system is shut down. Uh, but you can do a battery-based system if you live in a place where um, you have a lot of outages and you want to make sure that you have. Uh, power all the time, you can install a battery-based system. Here's an example of such a thing. You can see it's more expensive. You have to buy those batteries. So this is almost $10 a watt. Um, you, there's the 30% federal tax credit. Uh, there's another Arkansas state rebate. Uh, so you can see the final cost is uh, substantially less than the cost before incentives. Now, I want to wanted to point out very quickly that uh, these solar electric systems, battery-based systems, uh, the electricity that you're generating is, is exactly the same energy that you're getting from the utility. You can see the picture on the left, there's uh, the fluorescent uh, lighting fixture there. Um, everything works exactly the same way it does as it does on the utility. Um, if your utility grid-tied, uh, it uh, absolutely works exactly like the utility. Uh, with a battery-based system, if the utility goes down, you have some battery storage that so you can uh, make it through the outages. So, solar electric ballpark co costs and risks. There's quite a bit of range in costs depending on if you're just grid tied, or if you're a battery-based system. It's probably the least risky renewable energy project. Uh, it's been around for a lot of years. Uh, we've got uh, solar electric systems actually out in space that have been producing energy for 50 years. Um, very low maintenance, long warranties, uh, some solar uh, electric panel warranties uh, are 25 years. Uh, there are a number of experienced installers you can find. Uh, as I said earlier, the pet prices on uh, solar electric panels has dropped uh, significantly recently and so this is a good time to go get into solar electric because the panel cost is low and the incentives are still relatively high and of course the common problem is that high initial cost you've got this uh, big check you have to write when you put the system in uh, also, uh, dealing with the utilities, uh, some of them do not like you playing in their sandbox. And so when you uh, go to them and you say, I want to in interconnect a small generator, a lot of times uh, the utility is not very welcoming. And so you may experience some uh, complicated interconnection issues. So just to let you know. These are the new management uh, possibilities. You can, you know, any place where you can put some electricity uh, out in the range where uh, there was no electricity, no 
uh, no power and you don't want to haul uh, fuel out there, uh, you can be assured that uh, the sunshine will deliver the power for free on site. And so you can use these in a lot of these different uh, agriculture applications. And we'll talk uh, about the uh, common ones here in a minute, uh, most common ones, solar water pumping. Uh, less common, we can use solar, uh, solar electric systems to move the sprinklers. Uh, and uh, there's a actually been people that have built solar-powered tractors. A uh, very common uh, system installation that we have seen, a um, large number of these, is remote solar water pumping systems for livestock. Uh, it works very well. Uh, it's, it's relatively inexpensive because you can do it all with direct current. Uh, you're not trying to interconnect to the utility, and so you don't have the cost of that equipment. You basically have uh, the solar electric array uh, with a motor, uh, pump controller, and then of course the pump, you, uh, the well pump you have, uh, there's different ones that you can get, but this is a fairly uh, common thing to see, and, and there's a picture of one later, and then the the solar energy is actually stored in the storage tank. There's no batteries in this case. Uh, the, 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 the system pumps more when the sun is shining, uh, and so coincidentally, that's when the livestock are thirstiest, is when it's uh, sunny. And so it, it really is a good match um, and a fairly low cost way to do it. Uh, many different systems. This is a smaller system. Uh, this was installed in 2000, uh, about two miles away from the electric grid. It's a 240 watt uh, system. And this is on a tracker. Uh, the, the, these uh, solar panels actually track the path of the sun across the sky, and um, it makes about one gallon per minute from a 160-foot well, or 900 gallons per day, so that's enough for 20 uh, pair cow-calf pairs. This system cost about $3,200 in 2000. Here's a comparison. Uh, I'm going to spend a little time on this because it, it, it kind of shows what the cost of the solar components have gone in 10 years. Uh, the bottom line is um, the system on the left is the, the system that we just saw pictures of. The system on the right is a, sort of a generic uh, system uh, that I just recently got a, a quotation for. But uh, you can see that the system on the right will make about five times as much water from a much deeper well than the system on the left. And even though it makes five times as much water, it just costs about twice as much money. So five times the water for twice the money. That's the difference that 10 years makes. This is a, a kind of a neat system. Um, it's a trailer mounted system. Uh, what they do with this is they have several wells and they put the solar electric system on a trailer and so they can take it out and fill up a stock watering tank in one location and then they can uh, hook up to the trailer and tow it to another location. So they can use the same solar electric system to uh, pump water in a number of different locations. This is a very large system. Uh, again, this happened in 2000. Um, fairly good sized cow, uh, calf herd, five miles from power. The idea in this case was to get the cows away from the creek. So it has some riparian benefits. Um, this may make some of you think about uh, some of the other NRCS programs uh, for riparian, repairing riparian damage. Uh, you can use this kind of a system to do that. It's a fairly elaborate, expensive system. You see them uh, installing one of the arrays. There's actually two of them. Uh, high pressure uh, piston pump uh, pumps over two miles against 400 feet ahead, uh, and it uh, serves a number of st uh, stock tanks in that area. So for solar water pumping, some ballpark costs. Uh, you're going to be looking somewhere between $2,000 and $8,000 for the som uh, solar components. Now, uh, it's here's a good time to say that these systems are almost infinitely scalable. You can 
get almost as small a solar electric system as you can think of, uh, and you can also build them out of very, very large. There's very large systems. Um, not something probably that we can see some from space yet, but uh, there are very large systems out there. Uh, in 2000, solar trackers were much more common. Um, they do increase the energy output uh, from the solar array uh, up to 50%. Nowadays, the solar panels are cheaper, and so the trackers are not used as much. It's uh, considered to be cost-effective to just add panels on a fixed mount system. Uh, and not have the tracker, although the trackers are very robust and if you don't have much space uh, that you can use, uh, you can put your system on a tracker and uh, get more energy output per square foot of space that you have. The systems are uh, best suited to low flow, low pressure, low head situations, so if you're just moving water from a a creek up to the tank, uh, it's, uh, you can pump a lot more water uh, at high volume, low head, uh, than you can pumping from a deep well. Uh, the, the flow is much less. Uh, however, it, it can work. We have experienced vandalism. Uh, people have shot the solar panels, so it's, uh, it's nice to put them in locations uh, where they cannot be seen from a road. and. Um, you can hide them on the uh, south side of trees and, and things like this. Uh, cold weather and freezing issues, that happens with any kind of pumping system. Uh, there is a publication, an actual publication on uh, how to protect your uh, solar water heating from, or solar water system from freezing. Wanted to talk a little bit about solar water heating. This has uh, been uh, very popular with uh, farmers, especially farmers who do some processing. Uh, we've had a couple of big systems put in uh, locally here on wool processing uh, facilities on farms. Anytime that you have a lot of hot water use, and in particular if you have a lot of a big use for warm water, uh, you can very effectively use solar thermal uh, and it's the economics are not really that good for um, natural gas water heat but if you use electricity or propane then the economics are, are quite a bit better for um, solar water heating. Now uh, we do encourage dairies to do heat recovery from their refrigeration system or uh, groundwater cooling, uh, pre-cooling uh, using plate heat exchangers on their uh, milk uh, first. Uh, so that edges out the uh, solar water heating for, for uh, dairies. Here's a great example of uh, using solar water heat for a greenhouse. Uh, we're heating transplant, transplant tables and space heating for the greenhouse. It cost about $8,000 for the four solar panels and the piping. You can see the PEX tubing running under the tables in the greenhouse. It's a drain down system, so it's also called a direct uh, solar water heating system. There's no heat transfer going on. It's just using the water itself as the heat transfer medium to get the heat from the solar panels into the greenhouse. This was a very cost-effective system. It cost the propane costs from $3,000 down to $1,000 a year. So you can see before incentives, uh, probably about a four-year simple payback for this system. After incentives, more like a two-year simple payback. Design issues, if you're, especially if you're using a drain back system or a direct system, you have to be sure that it doesn't freeze. The solar panels are expensive, they will freeze, and they will break, and so you must protect them from freezing. You can't use toxic fluids around crops. Uh, you've, you might have leaks into the soil. That's why they use a direct system uh, for solar wa uh, water heating, solar water heating for greenhouses. A big problem with solar water heating systems, uh, probably the most common problem for solar water heating systems is they tend to get too hot. And so uh, you want to be able to get rid of that heat or you uh, 
need a way to uh, control the system so you're not using it uh, in the summer uh, if it's sized for the winter needs. And, and there's uh, different ways to design these systems. It's really critical to get someone who knows how to design the system for your location. Um, and if you need help with doing that, we can, we can help you do that. Um, We've sized a number of these systems successfully, and uh, we uh, what you want to do is size it for about 50% of the water, the hot water use. Uh, you don't want to try to generate all your hot water with solar. You always want to use some kind of a, a backup heating system, um, but the uh, solar water heater is very good at avoiding fuel costs, either electric or propane. Um, the tubing can be buried in the ground or above the ground. Uh, you can blow it through a fan coil into the greenhouse to heat the air in the greenhouse. Uh, lots of different ways to get the, the heat into the space. Here's a picture, another picture of one. This is used to, actually for heating oil in a biodiesel factory. And uh, you can see the uh, water heating panels up on the roof. This happens to be in North Carolina. A fairly new player in the game is uh, an evacuated tube collector. These are actually like vacuum bottles. Uh, the glass uh, in between the absorber or the collector itself and the surface of the glass is a vacuum. And the benefit of these kind of solar collectors is they have very low heat loss. I mean, it's just like your thermos bottle. You can fill the thermos bottle full of hot uh, coffee and uh, five hours later it's still hot in there. So uh, these are the same way. The sun shines through, heats up the fluid inside and uh, then the fluid is heat is transferred to the water. You can get high temperatures out of these so they're more uh, applicable to space heating uh, and uh, probably more cost-effective for space heating than flat plate collectors, even though they're more expensive. Um, the downside is they don't shed snow and ice because they don't get hot. And so um, if you put them up on the roof and you, you're counting on them for uh, heating, space heating in the wintertime, you might have to get out there and brush them off. <coughs> Simple payback for solar water heating systems. Now, this is without incentives, and you can see this is natural gas, probably not very cost effective. Uh, natural gas is cheap these days, uh, and so it's uh, pretty tough uh, for to justify a solar water heating system based on uh, the savings. Uh, for propane and electric, it's a little better. Uh, still, in, in some areas, particularly in the south, um, the economics is pretty good. Uh, if you, there's other things you can do about it. You can install the systems yourself. You can get the cost down. Um, shop around. There's a lot of different ways that you can get around the, the high initial cost. But in in general, yes, the systems they do not give them away, and so they uh, a lot of times don't have stellar economics. They can cost six to ten thousand uh, dollars for a typical residential system. Uh, this is before incentives. They're, the, the incentives do also apply uh, to solar water heat. Uh, this again is a very long-lived uh, technology. Uh, I got my solar water collectors used. They were twenty years old when I bought them. They've been installed on my house now for over ten years. Um, and so I, I expect them to last uh, many years into the future. Uh, it's, a, it's a very robust technology. Not much maintenance. Uh, it's people say that you want to change the fluid in it more or less like the coolant in your car, but uh, the, the systems don't shouldn't get that hot, and so the fluid uh, can last longer than. Uh, the coolant in your car, and I think 10 years is probably pretty conservative. You know, the the worst part about the solar water heat was in the in the 1980s. A lot of these systems got put in; they were poorly designed, and so a lot of them failed. Just about the first hot day of the summertime, they uh, overheated and they boiled the fluid out of them, and then the people never put the fluid back in. 
So um, if you can find one of these systems, uh, a lot of times you can take it off of those houses. Uh, they People want to get rid of them. So if you're looking, if, if you stumble across something like that, that's a cheap way to get a, a solar water heating system. Um, overheating was by far the most common problem. Uh, you need to be careful about the system design. Uh, we can help with that. Um, in evacuated tube collectors, it's sort of a new technology, so uh, they, they might have some loss of vacuum. Of course, when they, if they lose the vacuum, you're going to lose the advantage of the uh, less heat loss from the collectors. If you use a drain back system uh, or a, some kind of a direct system where you're using the water as the heat transfer fluid, uh, you have a potential for scale build up and so every now and then uh, you might have to run an acid solution like vinegar through it. It's like your coffee maker. Uh, it's a big coffee maker. You run uh, vinegar through it to take that scale out. Now we can talk a little bit about small-scale wind-powered electric, uh, electric generators. Now um, a lot of this talk uh, because of the, our affiliation with the uh, SRMEC, uh, we're we, we like to try to focus on the southeast. The southeast is not really known for its wind resource. You sort of have to get out into the, the Great Plains area to the west before you get into some uh, decent wind resource. Uh, the exception of that is along the coast. We're seeing a lot of applications of wind, uh, small wind in installations along the coast on the east coast. Um, Lots and lots of wind potential anywhere from uh, western Oklahoma and Texas, uh, Nebraska, North and South Dakota. This is, this is where the wind is, uh, potential is the best. And uh, there's a lot of it. And so there, it is a very good resource that we can take advantage of. The most important thing is to make sure that your wind turbine is exposed to the best quality wind that you can get. And, um, so what we uh, what we highly recommend or insist on <laughs> is a, a tall tower, uh, a horizontal axis wind turbine, uh, out of the out of the way of the influence from buildings and trees, and so uh, those are the the main thing about uh, wind turbines: location, location, location. You want them as tall as you can get them and in the best wind that you can present to them. Here's some ballpark economics for, uh, the, uh, this is a very common small wind turbine. It's manufactured in Oklahoma by a company called Berge. And uh, it's a very, um, we've, th there's a lot of these out in, in use. Uh, it's a good solid wind turbine. And you can see the difference in, uh, these different variables, uh, kind of a lower wind speed, uh, high cost and low cost, uh, energy generation, um, different installed costs. You can see that if you have a location where it's a more expensive installation uh, and the wind speed is not that good, you have a long payback time. If you have a, a good uh, wind speed, resource and you're fortunate enough, enough to have a low installed cost, then the simple payback can be more reasonable. So you can expect to pay for a small wind turbine somewhere between five to fifteen dollars a watt of in installed capacity. Uh, obviously you want to include the cost of the tower. There are a number of problems uh, citing small wind turbines. Uh, probably zoning and permitting is the the toughest one. Uh, your neighbors might not want you to have a wind turbine. They might think it's ugly or they might think it's noisy. So um, a lot of municipalities, a lot of counties uh, have permitting requirements that make it tough to put in a small wind turbine. Uh, you have the interconnection issues of solar electric. You have the same ones with wind. Um, so if you're considering a small wind turbine, about the first thing you want to do is call your utility and say, I'm thinking about putting in a small wind turbine. Uh, what do I need to do to uh, interconnect it? Uh, a big pro problem has been uh, people giving 
shall we say, um, optimistic energy production projections. Um, you want to be a little bit more conservative. Um, and you also, I know it sounds obvious, but you have to have wind. Um, a lot of people call me up and they say, I want to put in a small wind turbine. And um, I talk to them a little bit, find out where they're where, they're, where they live, and it's like, well, you could put a wind turbine in there, but it's probably not going to generate much energy because you don't have much wind. Um, so that's something that I, I get probably the most questions about that of any. Uh, the, the, what we call in microclimate sensitive, just because your neighbor, uh, maybe a couple miles away, has uh, good luck with a wind turbine doesn't necessarily mean that you will have good luck with a wind turbine. Um, it's very important to collect some uh, wind data before you put the wind turbine in. Uh, and whether you, uh, if you're going to install a wind turbine for sixty-five thousand uh, dollars, you should be uh, ready to uh, buy a, a little weather station for three or four hundred dollars and take the wind data over some time to get a better idea of what the wind is like in your location. Don't believe your neighbor because uh, we've got a couple of wind turbines here that you can actually, you can be at one wind turbine site and see the other two wind turbines. One of them does quite well and the other two do not. So it's really site specific. Uh, if if you can get some help doing the professional assessment, uh, collect some wind data. You're you're going to spend, you know, some thousands of dollars to find out if you have enough wind to make the wind turbine make sense, and you should be happy about this because uh, if you you spend the money on the wind assessment and it says yes this is the economics of the wind turbine then you know what the wind turbine is going to do if the the assessment comes back and says uh, no you don't have enough wind to uh, make a wind turbine make sense then you just saved the money that you would have spent on the wind turbine and you have a cool little weather station always kind of Look at energy output estimates with a jaundiced eye a little bit. Um, make sure that the manufacturer has a measured power curve. You want a machine that has been spent some time in a wind tunnel and has uh, actually, uh, they know what this machine is going to produce. You don't want one that, uh, that they say, well, we used computer models to generate the power curve. We want a, we want a thing that, that where they've actually tested the wind turbine. There are maintenance issues. A lot of uh, wind turbine manufacturers will say, oh, well, you know, if it's up there turning, you don't have a thing to worry about. Uh, but really, the systems need maintenance. Uh, every one to two years, um, you want to either be able to tilt the tower down to, to work on the turbine, or you're going to have to climb up the tower to work on the turbine. Uh, Climbing a tower, 100 foot tower or 120 foot tower, uh, is somewhat scary. So, uh, and you want to have training to do it. So, uh, this, these are things that are very uh, um, important to watch out for. Uh, we have seen catastrophic failures. Um, you can uh, get on the internet. You're, it's easy to find stories about wind turbines throwing their blades uh, off. Uh, and you, so you don't want the wind turbine necessarily right by your house. Uh, you want some distance between the house and the, the wind turbine. Um, so those are kind of some issues. There have been a, a large number of, shall we say, novel designs uh, out recently. And I see one maybe every few weeks. Uh, someone's come out with a new one. Um, and remember the basics that uh, you want the turbine to be as high as you can get it. Uh, a lot of these uh, new wind turbine designs uh, advertise that you, we can put this right on your housetop. Well, right on the housetop does not get it up above turbulence, and uh, so it's going to have a shorter time, shorter lifespan. Um, yeah, you need to be aware that um, these, a lot of these new systems have been relatively unproven. There is now a small wind certification, and you can look up the wind turbines that are certified, and the certification has to do with, yes, this machine will 
put out the energy that the manufacturer claims it will. Uh, that uh, URL there is uh, smallwindcertification.org. There are, I think, uh, the last time I saw there were eight wind turbines certified. Small hydroelectric, again, uh, it's all location, location, location. If you happen to have a stream or a, a water supply for your house, a gravity-fed water supply, uh, where you have some, uh, some distance between the, where it goes and dumps back into the stream and where it comes off the stream up above, that's called head. If you have that situation, you have a pretty decent flow rate. Uh, you can generate electricity with a small wind turbine. There's a number, small, sorry, uh, too many different renewable technologies. A small water turbine. Uh, you can get these small, uh, small turbines down to the 100 watt uh, range for capacity, and uh, obviously you can get uh, water turbines that are huge. So uh, again, a, a lot of scale to these different systems. If you have a a stream that you have access to, um, you might be able to look into it. The main benefit of this is the water flows all the time. So it's not like wind, it's not like solar, which are inter intermittent resources. The water goes all the time. So it, it, you, can, uh, you can really use it as a reliable source of power. Permitting is the major obstacle. Uh, if, if you're trying to use a stream uh, that has any, any use of commercial, any commercial use, then it's very difficult to permit and do this legally. Um, so, and there's a lot of variables in this particular case, especially if you're considering a fairly large uh, water turbine for a farm, uh, we would highly recommend getting a professional involved to do the design. A little bit on biodiesel and straight vegetable oil. Uh, this has been a much more popular technology. Uh, if you have a source of oil, of vegetable oil, uh, that's inexpensive, you may be able to run that uh, oil in, directly in your diesel engine. Uh, you need to modify the engine, uh, and so there's kits to do that for a lot of different engines, and people have done this successfully. Um, probably more common is to turn the oil into biodiesel. Uh, this is a chemical reaction. And uh, this the story of Philip Barker in North Carolina is a, a great story. Uh, he picks up waste oil, uh, cooking oil, uh, for $1.35 a gallon. And he makes it into biodiesel. And he's used this uh, on his farm uh, for uh, about three years, I understand, uh, and has saved himself a lot of money on diesel fuel. This uh, Thad Doy in Oklahoma uh, actually grows his own diesel fuel. He uh, has sunflower and he presses it. You can see the oil seed press there and uh, presses the oil, filters it, and uses it exact, uh, as straight vegetable oil in the diesel engines. Now you have to be a little bit careful about uh, just putting vegetable oil in your diesel tank um, because a lot of cases the, um, the engine doesn't like to start on ve vegetable oil so you want to start it on regular petroleum diesel and then once it's warmed up you can run it on vegetable oil and then before you shut it down you switch it back to petroleum diesel, but these uh, conversion kits uh, are available that help you do that. Costs and risks, you can make biodiesel out in your garage with buckets. Uh, so it's it can be a very low cost, um, Just you can just spend money on the materials and there's a few tools that you have to buy, uh, but you can make your own fuel uh, cheaply. And obviously, the, the more elaborate the system you do, the, the better the quality f fuel you make. Uh, if you're uh, concerned about the quality of fuel going into an expensive engine, uh, you're probably going to pay more attention to make sure the quality is, is very good. Uh, so you can spend, you can spend quite a bit of money on these systems. Uh, lots of problems, lots of concerns. 
Um, you can do it yourself. Um, most of the people making biodiesel are do-it-yourselfers. Um, there's some kits out there uh, and plans that you can get for low-cost biodiesel reactors. Uh, we can we can sure help you find those things. Um, it is messy. It's slippery. Uh, you're dealing with methanol, uh, which is uh, alcohol, uh, part of the uh, part of the chemical reaction. Uh, the, the things about the problem with methanol is you're using pure methanol. Pure methanol uh, burns with no visible flame, so you can actually catch on fire and not know that you're on fire. Uh, so this is uh, something that we we try to bring out the fa the fact that uh, this is this is really tricky. You've, uh, you've got to be very careful with it. Um, there are permitting problems and uh, it, tr it turns out that there may be waste handling problems also, mostly waste water. There are many other options. Uh, small biogas is uh, something that we're seeing more and more of, mainly in developing countries. Uh, very low cost methane digesters, uh, just about any kind of waste organic material uh, put into a container that doesn't have any oxygen, doesn't have any air, uh, will decompose. There's bacteria that will decompose that uh, material and makes uh, biogas. Biogas is anywhere from 50 to 80 percent methane. Methane is what we call natural gas. So uh, this biogas is flammable. You can use it for cooking. You can use it for space heating, and you can use it uh, to generate to run a generator and generate electricity. Uh, so um, these things, it, it, it is being done in the United States. It's very common. Uh, in other countries and um, lots and lots of resources on how to do it. Um, so it's, a, it's actually a very popular, not so much in the United States, but in other countries. Uh, other options, uh, small ethanol, uh, you can make your own ethanol fuel. Now ethanol is a replacement fuel for gasoline. Okay, so it's not a replacement fuel for diesel, it's a replacement fuel for gasoline. Uh, this can be done if, if you have a, a cheap source of grain you can make into uh, grain uh, alcohol ethanol uh, and the process is exactly the same as it is for making beverage alcohol because it's the same alcohol ethanol um, now if you're going to use it for a fuel uh, what you have to be careful about is the is the ethanol has to be pretty pure to use it. You can burn ethanol in your uh, gasoline powered uh, engine if at about 90 percent pure. Uh, if it's 90 percent alcohol, 10 percent water, you can use it as a, as a fuel uh, in your uh, car, for example. But if you're going to mix it with gasoline, it has to be pure. And so getting it from 90% to 100% is very is a lot more difficult. It takes a lot more energy, uh, tougher to do. So if you're going to use uh, ethanol in an engine, you probably want to uh, dedicate it to an engine and just uh, use the engine for a single fuel, not try to use it for both gasoline and ethanol. So. Um, at this point, I think that I can turn it back over to Rich, and he's going to talk a little bit more about ATRA and um, the different features of ATRA and the different services we offer. Rich, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, at this point, I was going to ask you some of the questions that our, uh, our viewers have sent in, but I wanted to point out that if you should have questions after the webinar, it's uh, not too late. Um, the webinar will be posted at uh, within the next few w.atra.incat.org. And if you should have other questions occur to you, you can 
go to our website there where you see at www.atra.incat.org and we have a function called Ask an Ag Expert and you can certainly go there. It'll walk you through the, uh, through the process and you can ask whatever other questions might occur to you. We also have our uh, 800 number, 1-800-346-9140, uh, which we will put up here in the screen in just a second. But Dave, I wanted to ask you some, some, a few of the questions folks have sent in. Um, do people ever include batteries in a solar pumping system? And uh, what's your opinion on this? What happens sometimes is we, um, if you have a situation where the well cannot support the volume that you would need to pump as much water as you needed over the course of the day, uh, but the, the well is drawn down too much, we've seen people put battery-based systems in uh, so they can basically spread the solar energy or the electricity out over more hours. So if the well is too, if the well doesn't have the capacity to handle the amount of water that the solar pump can pump, then uh, it, it, you might want to spread that out over more hours. And in that case, yes, we have seen people put battery systems in uh, water pumping systems. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, let me find this. What do you think, uh, what about using earth as an insulator around some outbuildings in conjunction with the solar panels? Something. Earth, uh, we call that earth berming. Uh, so you basically can put the building down partly underground or you can even put the building completely underground. The benefit to this is the ground has a fairly constant temperature. Um, in most places it varies from maybe 45 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So if your building is sunk down into the ground, you have less heat loss. It's um, uh, or you have either more, <laughs> you have less heat loss or less heat gain. If you're in the south and you want to uh, keep your building cooler, you can uh, put it down in the ground and take advantage of that uh, 50 degree ground temperature to help keep the building cool. So it, it uh, it's really more of an energy efficiency measure than it is a renewable energy measure but uh, we see it used uh, very commonly in solar homes and solar heated uh, buildings where they are earth, they are called earth integrated or uh, underground houses uh, where they are passive heated, uh, passively heated with solar and insulated from the weather by the ground temperature. Okay. Um, if there's Another one, if high initial cost is a big problem with renewables, it seems like financing should be the answer uh, to spread out the payments. Uh, can you talk a little about the loans and financing deals that are available? They are becoming more popular. Uh, one thing that has held up um, financial resources for uh, from conventional bankers is a lot of the systems are fairly well integrated into the home and so the, it's difficult for the bank to see their security there. Uh, it would be very difficult, say, if someone uh, defaulted on the loan for the bank to go and repossess the solar panels. Uh, very difficult to do in a lot of cases and that's caused some uh, reticence on the part of bankers to do the financing. There are financial resources available and uh, these are uh, usually you can get to them on uh, the Desire USA website because they're going to be um, in your area. Uh, where I live in Montana, the State Department of Environmental Quality 
has a, um, a revolving loan program. And so uh, you just have to look at for these financial resources in your area. They are getting to be more common. Probably the most common uh, financial resource has to do if you're building a new house uh, and you put the system on. Uh, many, many banks will let you uh, put the system cost in on your uh, home loan. Okay, and I think that's uh, really all the time we have. And so we'd uh, like, again, to thank the uh, Southern Risk Management Education Center uh, for funding today's webinar. And um, to, the webinar will be posted uh, within the next few days at www.atra.ncat.org. And while you're there, um, you might want to check out our other services, including the publications, the Ask an Expert uh, button that we've been showing there on our screen, our toll-free helplines, and, and we have quite a number of other webinars there available also. And I do want to remind our viewers one more time to take a few minutes to complete the survey that you'll see when you sign out. And the, one of the questions in the survey allows you to pose more detailed questions about the technologies um, or maybe a project that you have in mind to NCAT's energy specialists. And those specialists will answer your questions within two weeks of receiving them. So um, once again, thank you to the Southern Risk Management Education Center, and thank to all, thanks to all of you for attending today's webinar. <laughs>